woke us up. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all here this early spring morning. Welcome newcomers, longtime members, occasional attendees, and those watching online. My name is Preston Wilson, and I'm honored to be your celebrations associate today. Here, may we gather to nurture our connections, seek inspiration, and embrace change. And transformation is our theme for March, a time when we pay special attention to our faith, that we can transform this battered world by transforming our own conflicted selves into more loving and kind people. If you are new or visiting for the first time, we invite you to fill out a yellow pew card you'll find in the pew rack in front of you and place it in the offertory plate. You can also drop it off after the service at the welcome table in the parlor right through these doors where we usually have coffee, tea, snacks, and conversation. Please take a moment at your convenience to read the announcements in your order of service. The success of our many activities and programs depends upon your generous and voluntary participation. I would especially like to draw your attention to the newly established Care Cafe, which will be meeting today at 1215 in the library, led by Reverend Peaches and Christine Kaplan. It is a comforting, supportive, and safe space to listen and to be listened to. Now we have a few announcements from our own members and congregants. Michelle Hofstetter would like to speak for you for a moment on Unirondack. Hi, I'm back to talk about Unirondack. I did last week and I talked about nature and the beauty and kayaking and swimming and the food and how you get eight meals but you only have to cook for one. But I forgot there's still a lot more. There's this building that is called the Art Barn, I think, and you can paint over the water. You can do a lot more than just paint, too, during art times. Um, and mostly what I forgot to really talk about is that why Unirondack works is the intergenerational aspect of it. We all come together. Last year, our youngest person was Arlo. Remember Arlo in the dining room? And, and holding him and helping feed him, and this year he's gonna be walking around Uniranda, maybe even running, so you might wanna be there to see that. Um, and I didn't talk about, there's a building there that's pretty much for teens. Doesn't mean that a grown-up might not walk through, but that's, we create that space there, um, the camp does, and we continue it on our weekend to have that for the teens. Um, and a couple weeks ago, I went to watch Blue Zones with some of you and my friend Liz, and I sat there and I thought, Unirondack is the Blue Zone. So quickly, the Blue Zone is all these communities out there that have people that live past 100. Now, I'm not saying Unirondack is going to help you live past 100. <laughs> I can't guarantee that. But it can give you what the research is showing that helps you live longer that's making food together, good food together, in community. So if you're someone who doesn't have a large family or lives alone, come to your Ronda to be together. There's great benches to sit. We can have book talks. We can just knit together. We can basically do what you want to do. Just let the committee know. And today, Sue, Walt, and I are going to be at the table. Come ask questions and learn more about it. Thanks. Up is Matt Hare is going to talk about stewardship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to give you an update on the stewardship pledge campaign. Current pledges summed to over 176,000. That puts us, yes. Thank you. That puts us halfway towards our goal of $330,000. That's what it takes to run Cusick. This is a beautiful expression of our care for one another because our pledges help keep Cusick 
strong for everybody here, everybody online, all the children in RE and the wider community. It takes every one of us acting as stewards with gifts of treasure and time to achieve our connect, inspire, and engage mission. So those who have not yet pledged received the pledge card in the mail last week. Please use the fair share guidance as your guide to filling out the pledge form and sending it back in. Every pledge counts, large or small, to grow our connections and impact. Today, I'll be at the stewardship table with the cardboard church. You can fill out a pledge card there, or you can come and get a sticker, or you can get a smiley face sticker showing that I pledged. I hope you come and join me. Thanks. Okay, I have an announcement here from Renee Rogers about the Cabaret Night. Registration and tickets for the April 12th Cabaret Night will be available for purchase today after the service in the parlor, as well as online through Breeze. QR code will take you directly to a link connecting to the reservation form. Please contact the church office for assistance in purchasing a ticket. Tickets will be available through April 6th, and seating is limited. So that's a really good event. I remember we used to do it years ago, and we're bringing it back to Cabaret Night. Now, for our own special attention and appreciation, Jack Roscoe has a special announcement it's given to us in a special way. What good is sitting alone in your pew? Come hear the music play. The life is a cabaret, my friend. Come to the cabaret.
Please join me in saying the child's lighting words, which are printed in your order of service. We light this chalice for the warmth of the love, the light of truth, and the energy of our action. Madonna Stallman will now give the opening words. Good morning. Good morning. The title of the opening words this morning is called The Individual. Every individual is a member of the human family and makes a contribution to the life of society. The individual takes initiative, seizes opportunities, forms friendships, and builds relationships, joins with others in common service, and acts on decisions. In order to act effectively during the present period of transition in human history, individuals must above all be imbued with strong sense of purpose that impels them both to pursue their own spiritual and intellectual growth and to contribute to the transformation of society. These are fundamentally inseparable dimensions of a single process, for the standards and behaviors of individuals shape their environment and in turn are molded by social structures and processes. Our opening hymn is number 1024 in the Teo hymnal. And during this time, the children will collect for the side of love collection this week going to Planned Parenthood. Yeah. 
Welcome back. It's been a couple of weeks. A very thin scarf. You want to pull it out and show everybody? What color is that?
for Artie to join me in the parlor. Everyone else is invited to sing us out with Where You Go, which can be found in the back of your gray hymnal. Wait, you want to Today we sing While a book is a physical object, a sermon's content is, sadly, often ephemeral. How many times have we listened to a sermon and afterwards wished we had a copy in print so we could contemplate at our leisure the speaker's thoughts and feelings that we were unable to fully appreciate upon hearing them that one time? Granted, through our excellent technology team, we can see and hear the entire service again on YouTube, including the sermon. But now, as a supplement to and not a replacement for our YouTube site, Michelle Waffner and I are continuing to build a permanent text-based library of sermons. We have at present more than 50 sermons arranged in chronological order from newest to oldest that are ready for your perusal. Simply go to Fusit's main webpage at uuithica.org and scroll down to Service Archives, then to Sermon Transcripts. In this site, there will also be a subheading for Matters of Our Lives, as this is now. Many of the sermons in this archive were delivered in the summer months, during which we hold less formal services in the parlor Sunday mornings that feature the sermon, followed by respectful discussion. I am now recruiting speakers for this coming summer's services, running until the start of regular services in September. Please contact me about details and a placement. Our UU theology, though codified in official form, is more personally conceived in the total sum of all our thoughts, feelings, and actions that we elect to share with each other. When all is said and done, we are all each other's guides to the various truths that we seek within our multi-faith, lay-led community of friends. If you volunteer to give a summer sermon, you will not be video recorded, but your words, if you approve, will find a home in our growing text archive. For inspiration, Please visit the archive at, again, uuithica.org and know that what you think and believe is very important to the members of this society. I believe you will be impressed by the range and depth of the topics explored. Simply put, your admiration for the loving power of this society will grow. Would you like to reach out to others through the spoken and written word? If you decide to give a sermon, I can assure you that you'll find kind and attentive listeners who will be very appreciative of your sharing your good thoughts with them. Thank you. Now Renee Rogers will give the joys and sorrows.
in the spirit of reverence, love, and care, we take time now to bear witness to some of the joys and sorrows of our community. We want to share those events that call for our prayers and support, our praise and celebration. Steve Doria suffered a heart attack last week. He's recovering and will be released from the hospital soon. Our thoughts are with the Doria family. From Don and Sue Raykow, Don and Sue mourn the loss of Don's mom, Frances L. Raykow, who passed away on March 13th at the remarkable age of 102. We feel so, they, Don and Sue state that they feel so blessed that she was in their lives for so many years. For those we are holding in our thoughts, in our hearts, and perhaps in our prayers, let us call these names out loud into this community, into this space of healing and hope right now. We extend loving kindness to all in our world, and let us not forget to extend loving kindness to ourselves. Today, tomorrow, and beyond, may our hands be outstretched in kindness, and let us keep showing up to our lives and each other with an open heart, no matter what. Love and courage to us all, blessed be, and amen. Place your feet firmly on the floor. Rest your hands on your lap. Breathe in slowly and listen to your breath and the breath of those around you. Feel your body relax, allowing tension to be exhaled. Adjust your spine upright and tail. Meditate on these thoughts. Even when I am alone, the energy of others are with me. We are each here for one another. My breath is your breath. My heart is your heart. My hope is your hope. We belong here together, our lives here in this time belong here together. We breathe here together, our breath is life. Our breath is a way we are one. We each feel the movement of air within. We can hear and feel those around us. We breathe and release our breath. 
we breathe and release ourselves into the world. We are here together. We are here together. We are here together. the important ministries and programs of this congregation and its presence in Ithaca. Giving to the plate is important. It is a symbol of the gratitude for this service and our ongoing commitment to support for the work of this church. For those watching remotely, instructions for giving using your phone or computer will appear on the screen during the offertory music and in the information below the live stream image on YouTube. For those attending in person, the ushers will pass the plate.
join me in saying the offertory words printed in your order of service. May these gifts bring about connection, inspiration, and engagement within these walls and beyond. feel like the most energy I spend is a half hour before I get here. <laughs> so I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, when I came in, I was, as I left the house, my, grand, my grandnephews, who I call my grandchildren, have come up on Friday. And I kept thinking about them in terms of this concept of transformation and how their 10-year-old twins and I only met them when they were five. They were in foster care. Their father was a drug addict and their mother as well, who they found dead on the streets two years ago. And this is what they've gone through in 10 years of their lives. And when I met them, they were wild and almost feral because they just lived in environments in foster care homes where they were also abused and had no trust in anyone and did not feel any sense of love around them and were lost in this world. And when I met them, of course, as somebody who has spent my entire life working with children and growing up with eight brothers and sisters, I thought, I have to do something. And so I took them under my wing they don't live with me, but they come to me every summer and most holidays, and that's why they're at the house. And I must admit, when I left the house, I live alone, it's a small apartment, and it is very neat, and it is no longer neat <laughs> after, after one night of the children being there. <laughs> but I ran out of the house this morning, my brother's taking care of them, and I said to him, okay, you can make them eggs, and there's, there are English muffins, I'll put the toaster out on the counter. And by the time I left the house, I was like, just give them cereal. <laughs> They'll be okay. <laughs> but I thought about their lives and how they were sunken and broken in just a few years of being on this earth. That's a tragedy. And we know that happens to many children all over this world. And I thought, what can I do? I can't give them much. I don't have much to give. But what I realized is I can give them love and surround their lives with hope and bring them up here, send them to summer camp, and they are now transformed. They are more focused. They are trusting. They are happier. They feel free to express themselves in this life. And we're really good pals. One of them is a tech head. He loves technology. And the other one loves building things. So if you come into my apartment and you see pink slime dripping from the ceiling <laughs> and stuffed animals cut open from surgery, <laughs> that is what's going on in their lives. But it gives them room to be creative and to understand that there's more to life than being trapped in despair. That's the way I wanted to open today. <clears throat> We have entered into this era of loneliness and despair, and it's being talked about and written about all over the country. People have become almost inconsolable, feeling like they're alone and no one cares, as they also watch the world seemingly falling apart in the background. We have a tendency, all of us, to underestimate the ability to do for others. I think that most of the time when we think about those things, we think in terms of politics and institutions and economics and all those really big 
overarching things that we need to change. And we do do those things and we try to make a dent in it. But we forget about in our own intimate lives in the people around us who may be quietly suffering, that we can help change them and transform them into feeling that they're lost in the depths of despair, to feeling like somebody loves them and feeling like there's hope. And love and hope, believe me, are transforming. If you were here and heard about that story I told you about Mrs. Shapiro from school, that was transforming for me. A woman who treated me like I meant something in a world that told me that I didn't. It made a difference. It's why I'm here today. <clears throat> I found this headline <clears throat> in an article in USA America <clears throat> that loneliness is killing us. How can we combat this new epidemic? <clears throat> it goes on to say, America has a new epidemic it can't be treated using traditional remedies, even though it has debilitating and even deadly consequences. The problem seeping in at the corners of the communities of loneliness in the US, the Surgeon General said, is, is degenerating us, is blocking our awareness that we mean something. It's going to claim lives. This life can be overwhelming. We all know that. We talk about it all the time. We dream about it. We read about it. We watch it on TV. We can't hide from it. <clears throat> we feel can, we cannot begin to even penetrate this massive membrane of heartache that comes at, with injustices in the face of our lives in our homes, in our families. It's very difficult. We know we need change, and we, need, we know we need a complete transformation of our hearts and souls and spirits, of our systems, of our institutions, of our economy, so that those who have not and those who have can sit down at the same table and both equally be fed. Each of us strives to do what we can, and at times we simply feel like we cannot offer anything to anyone else. Or the worst of it is that what we have to offer is too little. We are too small. We are too ordinary. <clears throat> I want you to know that we're not. We never will be. Each of us in our own lives, if I asked you right now, have touched somebody else's life and have had somebody else touch ours. And that's powerful and that's meaningful and that keeps us going. Last spring I was at um, a conference, I think the opening of the Dalai Lama Library and I was sitting on a panel and sharing some stories that like I share here. And I shared the story about, um, just in general, about my mother. And it was, the, the focus was, where did our spirituality come from? <clears throat> and of course, I have to reflect back to my mother, because that is truly where it came from, her and Jackson Brown. But that's another story. Um, and as I was going through the story and talking about how I felt my mother always made me feel safe somehow, I don't even know why. She was just there and she made it clear that she was there for us. And that, without even words, made us feel safe. And I was the youngest child, so I loved being tucked under her. I remember her telling me that I was eventually going to talk her to death if I didn't stop asking her questions. <laughs> <clears throat> but as I was telling this story, and after we finished, and I was walking off and through the, the uh, corridor, I bumped into a woman in a wheelchair. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see you focus on other things. And she said to me that she actually was, wanted to come and meet me. Now this woman was, as I found out, was 93 years old, is 93 years old, and said she wanted to meet me because the story of my mother reminded me of the story of her mother. 
and how she felt protected by her. And, I'm, and somehow I was thinking, that's amazing. We come from completely two different worlds and here we're sharing something and we didn't even know it. There was nothing earth shattering about what I said to her, what I was saying, simple testament about my mother, her forgiveness, her compassion, the way she moved through life with the kind of grace that I admired. And when I crossed past Edith, and she reached out and grabbed my hand initially, and I felt like the softness of her hand, you know, that old hand that where the muscles are kind of gone already, and you know, they're kind of worn, but they almost feel like a baby's hand again. They're so smooth and amazing. And she started weeping. And she said to me that when she was a child, she and her mom had to escape Austria because of the murmurings of war to come. And her mom, in her cleverness and her grace, got her into France, had to pay money and use her body to save her child's life. She somehow felt she knew me. She thought we had a spiritual connection, and I think we did. And I say all this to say that since then I've been visiting Edith. She's in the nursing home up here at Brookdale. And we've become dear friends, and we sit and we talk about her life and her history. And we talk about mine, and we say, talk about uplifting things in the world that can be so downtrodden. And for me, there was something absolutely beautiful and perfect in what I consider our friendship. Edith and I have been transformed. We could never undo the change that was made in each of us by meeting one another across so many differences, across age, across race, across birthplace, across circumstances. We did something small. We dared to talk, and it ended up transforming us. When someone hungers, they'll eat what we have to feed them. We live in a world that suffers great hunger, hunger for food, hunger for love, hunger for homes, hunger for job security, living wages, hunger for basic resources, hunger for shelter, hunger for medical care, hunger for acceptance, hunger for human contact, hunger for community, and the end of, at the end of it all, what we're really hungering for is hope and love, the hope that comes through others. There's a wonderful quote about what transformation is. It's an unknown author. Human transformation is an internal shift that brings us in alignment with our highest potential. It is at the heart of every major aspect of our lives. It affects how we see and relate to the world and how we understand our own place in it. It is the change of the nature and heart of who we are. The nature of Edith's change was based on her tentativeness about black people. She used to be a racist. The nature of my change is that there's no perceived distance between me and another person that I will not try to cross. Hope and love fill us with the will to go on and even in the face of the thought that we cannot, we can when someone touches our hand and our heart. Hope and love come through many acts, and those like us, ordinary people, can engage in these acts and can provide hope and love and time that can change others. 
I found a few stories about ordinary people making a difference and transforming other people's lives, providing them with love because they saw and they believed and they acted. They knew that even if they could not change and transform the larger world, they could change and transform the smaller world of someone's life, and it made a difference. A woman named Caroline Linder in Nashville, Tennessee, who was a, hair, a hairstylist and a barber, decided that she would go every month, she would take a couple of her people from the shop and give haircuts to the homeless right on the sidewalk to help them feel good about themselves, to help them be touched by another human being and to nobody, know that somebody cared. A woman named Gina Camelli, after noticing a rise in poverty in her district, an elementary school teacher in Ohio wanted to help and she founded Paw Pantry, a nonprofit organization that brings clothes and food every day to the schools so the children could just simply take them home. It makes a difference. I know it does. When I grew up, we stood on lines to get cheese and food because we didn't have any money. Those are the things that made a difference in our lives. And they make a difference on a, a lot of levels. It's not just because it feeds your body, but it really keeps reminding you that there are people out there who actually care. And that is something that is easy to forget in the world that we live in. There's so much meanness and so much hate and so much anger and so much destruction that you almost think the numbers of people who are caring are very few, but it's not true. There are more people who care than there are more people who are not. If there were more people who didn't care, we wouldn't even be sitting here right now. We're lucky. And these little things make us remember that. And we must remember that in order to go on. A man named Jeffrey Thomas scarves for students while teaching special education in Louisville, Indiana, Thomas noted a, noticed a large number of kids coming to school with nothing warm on them and decided to get scarves and coats and hats and just give them away freely. It's such a beautiful thing when people do those things. It's so beautiful to me because it means that we are touching, we are reaching, we are understanding, we are seeing, and we are empathizing deeply for somebody else's needs. There's a pastor called, who created a place called God's Garage, which I kind of think is cool. <laughs> um, I would take my car there. <laughs> One day, Pastor Chris discovered that a mother and child from his congregation were walking along the highway, and it inspired him to start a place called God's Garage because she had a car. She couldn't afford to get it fixed. So he got together a bunch of work garage mechanics who volunteered every month to fix somebody's car for free. That is huge. That's amazing. We all know how much it costs to fix cars just so these people can get to school and to work and wherever they need to go, the grocery shop. Someone named Rodney Smith, Raising Men Law, Lawn Care owner, noticed an old man pushing a lawnmower in his yard that was kind of breaking down and not working well, and the old man couldn't get it to fix. He was bending over, tinkering with it, and he couldn't do anything. And this man decided he's going to get a bunch of his guys together who are going to fix lawnmowers for all the aging people in the community. Very simple, very basic, but it makes all the difference in the world. I remember when I was younger, we often, <clears throat> my mother was a, a single mother with eight children who had hitchhiked up from the South trying to make her way in New York City. And I remember there were times when we didn't, didn't have lights in our apartment. And it is painful. When I think of kids like that nowadays, I know I don't have to imagine, I know what it's like. 
And there was an old man who lived next door to my mother. His name was Mr. Connolly. Um, he was this wonderful man who somehow took to my mother and he would pay her light bills without even asking. And we found out later that it was him. And I remember <clears throat> thinking back to my mother once telling us that, like King, that you only judge people by the, character, the content of the character and not by the color of their skin. And this Irish man who hugged my mother, that was a moving experience for me, a transforming experience for me who made me understand that even in the middle of a racist neighborhood that there were people who were like angels floating around us all the time. And we somehow we just have to look and we will see them. All over the world, people like you and I are saving the day for somebody else in the simplest ways. Don't ever underestimate that. We are incredible human beings. It is exactly to the degree that we can be horrible, that we can be amazing. We've all seen it. We still see it. We are those people. Never minimize that. Never minimize the fact that love can transform us and transform the world around us. And the world will only be transformed when we're transformed. When we talk about institutions, we talk about them as if they created themselves. We created them. And the way they don't function now is what we've done. And we can undo that and make them work better for each and every one of us. I came across this preamble in the United Nations 2000, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This agenda is a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity. It also seeks to strengthen universal peace in larger freedom. We recognize that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. All countries and all stakeholders acting in collaboration and partnership will implement this plan. We are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want and to heal and secure our planet. We are determined to take the bold and transformative steps which are urgently needed to shift the world into a sustainable and resilient path as we embark on this collective journey we pledge that no one will ever be left behind. Well, we can pledge that no one will be left behind, even in our own lives, if we can, whatever we can do. Sometimes it takes just bringing a meal to someone, helping them with their laundry, looking into their car. All change and all transformation begins with each of us. It begins in the hearts of individuals and swells into a monumental call for action. We're very capable of that. We know that. I'll end this with that quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Closing him is 348, Guide My Feet.
strain every nerve to acquire both inner and outer perfections, for the fruit of the human tree hath ever been and will ever be perfections, both within and without. It is not desirable that a man be left without knowledge or skills, for he is then but a barren tree. Then so much as capacity and capability allow, he needs must deck the tree of being with fruits, such as knowledge, wisdom, spiritual perception, and eloquent speech. Transformation is no accident. It is necessary to keep us progressing in the physical world. All things are subject to transformation and change, save only the essence of existence itself. It is constant and immutable. Distinguish the chalice here. Yeah, I got a lot of things going on here. Okay. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.